So thank you so much for 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 being here, and uh, we had the honor to have uh, already a masterclass this morning from uh, from Siena and. Uh, uh, and to to make sure that we continue with uh, with uh, Siena, and we're really grateful of sponsoring this uh, this session as well. Um, we have a topic here. Um, uh, and we're going to discuss the, the submarine technologies and the latest technological innovation and developments, which is what is out there. So I would really like if we can make this interactive as possible. If you have questions, just raise your hand. Somebody will come with a microphone, and you can have your questions. And because it also makes it, I mean, we do this for you. But, you know, on the other side, you know, we, we also would like to have your comments, your interaction. And so if you have any questions, please come forward um, and um, I, let's do it like, I mean, this is my room. This is my, my living room, right? So I would love to have um, uh, the conversation with all of you because we do it for you. Okay. So again, um, thank you for coming. And having said that, um, I would give the um, uh, the opportunity um, kindly to to all my fellow panelists. I mean, I'm Eric. You know me, but not all of you know these uh, these gentlemen, these senior executives here next to me, which I'm really grateful having here and I'm feeling really honored. So um, I'll give them a quick minute to introduce themselves, so you know who you who you're looking at and who you're listening to. And uh, we're more than happy to have this knowledge sharing session uh, session with you. So. Darwin, if I may start with you, please. Yeah, sure. My name is Darwin Evans. I'm the Senior Director of Product Line Management at Siena. I'm responsible for uh, all the subsea technology at Siena. Thank you, Javier. Hi, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Oman, even if we welcomed you yesterday. My name is Javier. I work in Zoe, and I care exclusively about submarine cables, anything that has to do with that. Good having you. Buongiorno, Luca. Buongiorno. I am Luca Lucchesini, uh, head of uh, SLT activities uh, for Nokia, and as usual, also representing ASN colleagues, so acting vice admiral. <laughs> vice admiral, thank you. Good having you. Afrin? Hi, um, my name is Afrin Becker. I am from Infinera, and I'm a director of um, submarine network solutions, uh, uh, mainly focusing on EMEA. Thank you. Thank you. Good having you. And last but not least, Kiran. Good morning, uh, Masaki Hirano, that uh, call me Hirano, that uh, I'm Japanese, so it's better, better to call me as uh, a family name. But anyway, mm -hmm. I'm the uh, responsibility for the uh, optical uh, fiber for subsea and the terrestrial long haul network, the product manager. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So now you know who you're uh, looking at and listening to. Um, we're going to start with uh, with a very interesting um, um, uh, keynote presentation from uh, from Siena, from, from Darwin. So Darwin, if I may... Invite you, please, and take it away. The floor is yours. All right, thanks. So we just had a keynote from Richard, from Richard, who talked about technology. So I'm going to take a little bit different tact here. I want to talk about sustainability in submarine networks. Uh, yesterday, this came up a little bit. If anybody was at the the data center session, and they were talking about how many megawatts of data center. Uh, connectivity they're bringing in, but they're also talking about the green energy required to run those data centers. I'm going to be talking about sustainability in a little different way. I want to talk about how we control how much energy we need so we can continue on the path of increasing network uh, connectivity. If we look across the planet, we become more and more and more connected especially during the COVID time when we were all locked in our house and had no choice but to connect via Zoom and WhatsApp and whatever else. But with that brought a big growth in the amount of devices required and a big growth in the amount of capacity the networks had to deliver for us to be connected. And that all drove more energy use. If we look at the Paris Accords and the science-based target initiatives to look at how much energy everybody's using and how to decrease that. They've lumped all of us in this area called telecom, media, and technology. And in this area, the estimate is we're about 4% of the global carbon emissions. If we keep on our current CAGR and keep growing the network and don't do anything about the electrical efficiency of the network, by 2040, 
we could represent as an industry 40% of the global carbon emissions. Obviously, that's not something any of us want. And everybody's doing things in different ways to offset that. Like I said yesterday, a lot of the people in the data center area were talking about the, the use of green energy. But there's other things we can do. The first thing we need to do is figure out where are we using energy? So if I'm a, an operator and I want to look at my operations, where's my energy coming from? Well, the first thing is the goods and services you buy from me as a vendor. We have to source it. We have to get the parts. We have to manufacture it. All of that energy has to be accounted for. And then we have to ship it to you. And once it gets to you, you have all this packaging, and that's a waste, most thrown away or recycled, but it has an impact in terms of the efficiency of the network. And then you've got all this stuff, and you have to have your employees install it so you can actually start using the network and there's more energy use there. Then the big one, putting it in the network, getting capacity across the network, monetizing all this equipment, but you have all that ongoing energy use of the equipment. And then once the network has passed its usable life, you have to take that equipment out and treat that equipment at the end of life, go through the recycling process. So these are a bunch of areas where we have to look at what is the carbon footprint. So we sat down and took a look at, okay, what is the factors from all these? Where is it that we need to look at and figure out the best places to start looking at ways to reduce our carbon impact? When we looked at it, there was two big regions that popped out. The first is the sourcing of the equipment, manufacturing the equipment. 16% of the total energy went into making it, into the supply chain, into sourcing components, building, building modules. And then the real big one is the operation of the network. 82% of the carbon emissions were coming from just day-to-day -day operations of the equipment. Everything else, basically a rounding error because we're at 98% of the carbon emissions coming from those two things. So when we sit down at Sienna and look at what is the things we need to do to help decarbonize, obviously having operational efficiencies is going to be great. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit there, but that's that last 2%. What we really need to do is make sure we have an efficient supply chain where we're not expending too much energy or having a lot of emissions from, and we have to innovate for sustainability because the majority of what happens is in the operation of the equipment that we sell to you and you put in your network. We actually did a study not that long ago in the subsea space because somebody said, well, I've got this wet plant, it's there, it's got the PFEs, I can't really change that. I'm not gonna change the efficiency of my network. Well, 90% of the power used on a cable is in the SLT. Only 10% is in the actual cable itself. So making sure we have the most sustainable, energy efficient SLTE is gonna have the biggest impact overall on how the network operates. And we're talking here, obviously, sustainability, the things that are good for the planet, but this is also good business because we wanna reduce the, the power per bit, and the space per bit, and that all turns into dollars per bit when you're looking at the operation of the network. Since 2010, there's been a 185 time increase in the capacity Sienna ships per year. In that same time, luckily, we've had a 90% reduction in watts per gig. So we've done a lot to offset the amount, the fact we're shipping a lot more capacity by making sure that that capacity is much more efficient. But we can't stop because as I said before, if we stop now and keep operating at the efficiency levels we're at, we are going to grow from 4 to 14% of global emissions. We don't want that to happen. So we have to keep working and making sure that we're innovating for sustainability, innovating to reduce that space per bit and power per bit, and as a result, hopefully helping you get down to the dollar per bit as well. Anybody who's here for Richard's keynote, he talked about our next generation modem. 
Wave Logic 6. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail here because Richard uh, already talked about that. But with any piece of equipment, the best way to make it more efficient is get more and more bits for that one piece of equipment. And that's what the next generation of modems is all about. Finding a way to double the number of bits we're putting through the same amount of equipment, helping us reduce the power, reduce the space, reduce the dollars per bit. For WaveLogic 6, the way we're doing that is through two things. Industry's first three nanometer DSP, which is really helping us be as power efficient as possible, while allowing us to put in a lot of new features to help increase the spectral efficiency. So we're getting more and more bits for that one piece of equipment. And then combining that with high bandwidth electro optics. So here it's pointing out the ICR, the CDM, so the transmitter and the receiver that we're using in WaveLogic 6 that we showed off at OFC back in March. These are 100 gigahertz electrical bandwidth. When you turn that to optical bandwidth, that's a 200 gigabaud modem. So really doubling the bandwidth that we've had over previous generations. And we take these things together, that's going to help drive down the power per bit, really help us with that sustainability. But I want to look forward. What other things can we look forward? What can we do next to help drive that down? And we have to look beyond just the equipment. In a data center, most transport equipment is air-cooled. And for every watt that you spend in operating the equipment, on average, you spend 0.9 watts cooling that equipment if you're using air cooling. So what we've done this year is we put together a proof of concept lab, lab demo. Anybody who interested in coming to Ottawa, I'd recommend not in February, it's kind of cold, but if you're interested in coming to Ottawa to see this, more than happy to show off what we've done. We've created a hybrid liquid air cooled solution. And there's a couple examples up here. You can see a rubber module and a transport module that we've done this liquid cooling uh, testing on. And when you go from air cooling to hybrid liquid air cooling, there's a 70% savings in the amount of power you acquire to cool those electronics. But there's also an additional savings because now the fans aren't running as fast and I get an electrical savings on the power required for the fans. And overall, I get a pretty decent savings in the amount of electricity I require to operate it. Because I'm not just looking at the equipment now anymore. I have to look at the entire operation and cooling is a big part of that. But there's lots of great side effects. Anybody who's been in a data center or CO and you had to put in your headset because it's so loud because you have all these fans running at a million miles an hour. When you go to hybrid cooling, the fans don't have to run as hard. It gets much quieter, much more easy to work in that environment. And if we look forward, this will allow us to do some trade-offs. We can we can put more processing power into the DSPs. We can put more processing power into the pluggables and take them beyond the limits that we're seeing now that can be cooled with air as we move to this idea of going to a liquid air cooling hybrid solution. So hopefully you've got an idea of why sustainability is important to us and also the kind of things we're looking in the future to do to help push that uh, sustainability forward even more. Thanks a lot. I'll pass it back to Eric. Thank you, Darwin. Um, any questions for Darwin? Remember what I mentioned before when we started this session, I want the interactivity with you guys. So you need to come up with questions. No questions so far? There is, yeah, is there a question? There is a question. You see, thank you so much. Hey, Andrew Dogan, I'm, I'm going to ask it as a person, not as a company or anything. So uh, sustainability is super important. Here's my being in this industry for so long. Here's my observation. We had, we do the, and the question with it, we do decrease the power across all the elements. I, I'm in IP space, same thing. You guys in optic space, same thing. Here's a, here's a dilemma that I, I see in this process. Number one, uh, we don't really measure it as vendors in a uniform way. So what do you think we should do about it? Question one. Question two, um, all those numbers are interesting, 
but fundamentally we're missing as an industry we're missing a point a little bit because it doesn't matter how much we decrease the power per bit it matters how much we decrease power per user so if we decrease a power per bit in our equipment ip equipment optic equipment by 90 percent yet a user in the in the capacity we we giving to people uses you know thousand times more then we we still not decreasing the power as industry so and hence my second question is do you guys think we should start measuring our power uh, utilization uniformly and measure it in something more relevant uh, to the footprint per user rather than footprint per, per bit, which is, I'm not even going to go further into how it can be misleading. So that's a good question. And actually, you're not the first one to ask that. At the uh, last Suboptic, there was a new working group created on sustainability because of the, the exact question you asked, how do we measure ourselves as an industry and make sure we're measuring everything and making sure we're measuring it the right way? Uh, if you look at the data center industry, there are different metrics and depending on how you report the data, it can be a little confusing. So in the submarine world, um, Suboptic has really stepped up in a, in a number of areas to create working groups. And uh, this is one of them. They've created a, a sustainability working group because we want to answer the questions you've just asked. And there's a lot of people with uh, a lot of different opinions on how we should measure it. Uh, to get a little bit of scientific rigor, the person running the sustainability group is actually being uh, brought in by Suboptic Foundation. She's a professor from... NYU, I believe, I can't remember, uh, Nicole's, I think she's at NYU, to give it some scientific rigor in how we do this process. So don't have an answer for you, but yes, it is a question a lot of people are asking, and to be able to find the answer, the Suboptic uh, has created this working group, and everybody who's interested is more than willing to to join this working group and, and help Nicole with uh, the work she's doing. Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay. Well, gentlemen, are we ready for the panel discussion? <laughs> Let's move in. Talking about, there is another question. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry for that. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Labunis, uh, I'm just having a question regarding the new, uh, each new regeneration, the new nanometer, I mean, seven nanometer, five, three nanometers. Whenever we have a generation, we're increasing the baud rate. And apparently, it will increase as well the spectrum used per channel. Is it a little bit contradicting with the spectral sharing requirement? Because the ideal situation that you are sharing the spectrum, so you have uh, sharing between more uh, wholesaler consumers ac uh, across the fiber. So is it a little bit how you measure and you, you find the sweet spot where it's optimal between the board rate, the spectral uh, widths, and the spectral sharing requirement? That's another really good question, uh, and you're not the first to ask that as well. The, the concept of spectrum sharing is great because you have this shared medium and you can put a lot of users on it. But as you said, if the channels get wider, I can put less channels in the amount I've bought. The reality with spectrum sharing it is from an economics perspective, there's a certain point where it doesn't make sense economically to share spectrum anymore because of the equipment required to do spectrum sharing. If, it, if you're not buying enough spectrum to justify all the spectrum sharing equipment, why would you do it? It's going to be cheaper to buy a managed service, a managed wavelength. So when we're looking at spectrum sharing, that tipping point is about a third of the bandwidth of a cable. So if a cable is about four and a half terahertz, anything less than a third doesn't really make a lot of sense. Maybe a quarter, depending on the application. But if you go anything less than that, economically, spectrum sharing really doesn't make sense. So if you stick at a quarter or a third or a half, then you're 
really aren't running into problems of the fact that your channels are wider. You have enough spectrum to deal with that. Does it answer your question? You're happy now? <laughs> That's good. Any other questions? Silent. Okay, let's move on. Submarine technological latest uh, innovations and, and, and developments. What I'll, I'll give the... Uh, all the gentlemen, a quick. I mean, we we heard the 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 the, the vision already. Let's say the the helicopter view a bit already from uh, from 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 Darwin. So um, just a helicopter view for you. Just just setting the 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 pace here. The 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 landscape. Javier, if I may start with you, what what do you see? Okay, the characteristics you see today. You see this working. Okay, yeah. so. I was glad to be in this panel because we are, as Zoe, we are part of the CMV3 consortium. If you are familiar with this cable, this is basically the longest thing ever made by mankind. It's 39,000 kilometers, and it's going to be decommissioned in one year. And then we have all these questions about environmental impact that are just coming, some of them as a shock. Because then suddenly you realize that you have a massive infrastructure that has, because we talk about power, power efficiency, uh, consumption in the SLTE, but nobody's talking about how much power, time, resources, energy you are using to build something so big that is going to be abandoned and in most cases recycled depending on where. Because in some places, Government will tell you you are forced to retire, to recover it, and to scrap it. And in some cases, like international waters, it will depend if there is a, an economic case to recover this cable. And with this kind of cables, you don't have plenty of copper inside that is justifying this operation. So what I see is that, however, my feeling is that this cable as itself, as the construction of the wet plant, it's going to be probably more environmental friendly or having less impact than these new generation cables. And I will tell you why, because this cable was useful during 25 years, where the new cables, when I talk to the parties funding them, many of them are telling, ah, this will last 10 years and then we move to the next one because you know uh, technology efficiency, blah, 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 all this kind of blah, blah, blah. So at the end, I will say that any contribution, any technological contribution that increase the useful life, commercial useful life of a submarine cable will probably have a bigger impact than any power mm, optimization we can do. No, because, uh, I mean, get the ship to do 10,000 kilometers, you know, rolling out the cable. I mean, there is a, I mean, if the transponders looking at uh, over there <laughs> and, and uh, over there would be a bit more powerful. I mean, you know. Yeah, I remember when we are talking about a ship, a vessel, we are talking about the ton of diesel, ton of lubes. We are not talking about the what. No, oh, exactly. Thank you. Okay, next for you, maybe. What is your helicopter view? What do we see in the landscape? Um, thank you very much for the very good question. And uh, we, as a fiber manufacturer, how to contribute to the sustainability? I think we have uh, two points. One point is to enhance the fiber performance. Yes, uh, the power consumption at the SLT is huge. And if you decrease the power from the SLT, this means that the OSNR will be very low. In that case, the low attenuation fiber will help to construct the very high performance uh, cable system. This is one point. The second point is to enhance the SDM. You know, the cable the manufacturing, uh, during the cable manufacturing, uh, they use a lot of power and a lot of copper, of course. But the inside the uh, cable, the fiber count is limited to the uh, 48 today. But 
uh, if we get into the more SDM system, like a two core five or four core five, I will talk uh, in this afternoon, then the fiber capacity or the cable capacity in a single cable will be enhanced to what four times efficient. This means that the low power consumption and also the fiber manufacturing. The after the fiber manufacturing, fiber drawing uh, requires a lot of power. It uh, we need to heat up the pre glass preform around 2000 degrees C. It's a huge power. But if we have the uh, two cores, the power consumption after drawing will be higher. Okay, so as a conclusion, we have two that are lower ordination fiber and uh, SDM fiber. That's my mm. comment. Okay, thank you. Good points. Afri? Thank you, Eric. Yeah, so uh, the environmental cost is indeed very pertinent to uh, in, in, in this day and age. And um, from a perspective of um, solutions provider, a vendor, we, um, we are indeed, you know, with... Um, a higher board rates, uh, providing more capacity for the same cost, if you like, um, what what's per per gigabit. Uh, another uh, question: where the technology uh, can and is actually contributing is um, uh, decosting, decluttering the network. You know, so um, from an Infinera perspective, we have, for example, what we've uh, come uh, uh, productized the uh, points or multipoint optics. Where you you know in network studies, for example, uh, there is um, there is a um, up to seventy percent of you know decosting of a network from a power footprint, and obviously you know the dollar perspective. So uh, the, yeah, there is a lot more that the uh, you know the technology can do and 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 will do, but ultimately um, yeah we need to um, work in in. Um, Main, uh, managing the amount of energy that we need to use. Okay, thank you. Luca, so your view, please. Well, yes, so lots of, uh, let's say, questions uh, and uh, inputs. Uh, so let me try to make a little bit of an order and also recap uh, what we heard uh, yesterday from uh, Sohil and uh, our uh, host here. Now, uh, first of all, yes, power per bit, that's definitely a crucial met uh, metric. And in the industry, we're all doing this. Uh, uh, the good news uh, that uh, I would like to bring is you don't need to wait three nanometer because actually the big jump in uh, power consumption and efficiency per wave, you already have at five nanometer. So just last week, we launched the first 800G wave across the transatlantic and Five nanometer does the job. As well, uh, you can drop and cut the number of your transponder by a factor of three with five nanometer, which basically is a shipping now, practically. But anyway, this is a general trend. It's good to see that everybody's on this trend. So the power per bit will go down. Now, let me extend a bit, as uh, Javier rightly pointed out, to marine operation and wet plant. Absolutely true. That's a huge part of the footprint. And um, two pieces of good news, basically. First piece of news is that, indeed, recycling is picking up. Uh, because, basically, there's a lot of value in undersea cables. So just to give an idea to Africa, which is uh, going to service now, is uh, 50,000 tons of copper, steel, and the materials that uh, there's a few, let's say, recyclers out there, very efficient, that uh, are vying for service providers to tender. Oh, we have an old cable, who wants to pick it up? So definitely this is a trend that should be encouraged. And always on marine operation, uh, at Nokia as uh, ASN uh, the division, uh, one big change, uh, one big help to, let's say, improving the environmental footprint is maintenance ships. Because maintenance uh, requires fuel for the lane, but also for the maintenance of the cable. So what we are doing is uh, whenever capex uh, and budget allows that uh, we repower the ships basically so we make them more fuel efficient but also and here i would like to reconnect what suhail was mentioning yesterday in his keynote uh, 
uh, we need to take a holistic approach because if we start interconnecting some sub network with the terrestrial network and integrate, uh, and we can leverage the prote protection between multiple sub system, that means that in case of failure, we can allow longer mean time to repair. Longer mean time to repair means that the ship can take longer to do the repair, can go slower. And if a ship can travel at 20 knots instead of 24 knots, it seems a little different, but in terms of fuel consumption, you cut by 30%, and it's huge. Oh, absolutely. That, 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 that's, um, that's, we're talking about the, the, the latest in, um, uh, technological innovations and developments, which actually, um, uh, you know, help us to decarbonize more and more and more, Darwin. I mean, um, but from your point of view, I mean, um, as the gentleman rightly said, I mean, we are sort of in a dilemma here, right? I mean, we, we can be as decarbonized, green, whatever we want, but the consumption demand is going up. I mean, sometimes I'm with, with family and they say, Eric, what do you do? You're in telco, but, but, you know, you should be more greener. I said, yeah, but you know what? When you wake up, the first thing you do is not getting a coffee. You're going to check your cell phone and the latest videos on YouTube and whatever. So how do you think that happens, right? So that dilemma is there. And and I'm not saying, hey, look into the mirror, but it it, it is quite, it, the discussion is, is, is getting quite tough, right? So, I mean, what else can we do? Well, what, what, I mean, we can never stop. I mean, we, we, we always need to be innovative and, and bring new things. And I mean, we're human beings. We're clever, intelligent people. We can, we can work this out. So what yeah, from your point of view? Exactly. And I talked about that, that if we do nothing, if we just stay at the efficiency we're at, our industry would go from 4 to 14% of global emissions. So we have to find things, find ways to be more efficient because the demand is going up. We can't just... Keep, in keep at the same pace yeah, at a very, very fast, fast pace. pace. Now, we did have an inflection point a number of years ago when we moved from IMDb to coherent, yep. and that really helped us. We are nobody has proved clutch and wrong yet. So we're we're probably reaching a point where the capacity increases totally aren't going to go up, but we have to make find ways to make sure that what we are putting out. Incre decreases on a much more rapid pace than we are now, which is why, as I was saying, we have to look forward. We have to look outside just the equipment itself. What are the other things in the ecosystem that we have to look at to make sure that we're depowering, decarbon, reducing the carbon and, and things like cooling are becoming more and more important because there's a huge amount of power used in cooling huge that, that we have opportunities that the compute side has already started on the, the, the gamers. Uh, oh, oh, they, they always uh, lead the way uh, going to water cooling. And as a telecom industry, we've resisted that because there's complexity involved. We have to get past the complexity. Like you said, we're all very smart. We can find ways around this. So we have to look at other things that can draw drive energy out of the network and, and things like... Um, water cooling is probably the next area that, uh, as an industry, we really need to focus on. No, absolutely, and and I mean the 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 the, the hybrid uh, the, the hybrid liquid um, uh, solution is is a very good one. Um, on the other hand, if data centers are not that far, what they could do, and what you do you see, for instance, in Europe, is on the data centers that they use the heat that it consumes actually, and they bring it back to the community where they can use actually the the heat coming out of the cooling. Well, there, with there, me, I still with me. Yeah. The heat we just come out of the cooling. There's a, a cable proposed called Leif Erikson, which would go to uh, Labrador, northern Canada, which is yes. next to one of the world's largest hydroelectric generation plants. And you think, oh, great, it's very clean energy, and the heat that comes out is perfect. You can use it to heat the community, but unfortunately, schools, hospitals. Yes, but unfortunately. Northern Labrador is like 20 people and 400 polar bears. So it's not the most efficient place to put that data center. So you have to, we have to find ways to make sure we can 
but the data centers where they're useful to people and still have access to green energy and still have access to ways we can use the waste heat. No, absolutely. But but again, it is something which 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 could absolutely work. Javier, anything from you? What would be your take? But what, what, what well, else can we do? What 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 more can we? You know. And... Well, you know, the the good news is that um, energy costs money. So at the end, we can say yes, we're saving the planet, but I live. We here. have we you have a big me? drive to <laughs> reduce our cost. So it's it's automatic that comes that comes all of this comes. And what I can say is that is impressive. And I, I I can tell you that a few days ago we were thinking about where to put our SLTs in a submarine system we're involved in, and I was in my head I has this you know big room with big consumption. Uh, should we put this in the CLS? Should we put that in the data center because it's more efficient? And then someone told me, uh, well, with the next generation, this is going to be two racks and seven kilowatt full design capacity. So I think we are, we are getting there, right? <laughs> of course, this cable system has 16 fire pairs. So you have to multiply that by existing. But still, if you look into an old cable landing station, as we have in the legacy systems, you will go <laughs> into 100 meter square room having a um, significant consumption. So it's going there. It's all the whole industry is going there. I think, and also I think that we have still, <laughs> you know, enough space to improve. Well, if you talk to the airline guys or you talk to the maritime freight guys, they cannot improve so much. No, I know. So good news. Yes. <laughs> exactly. I think we have a question from the from the from the room, and uh, Bartosz will be so nice to uh, to give you the microphone. Thank you. Provided that I'm Stefano Resi from Nokia, I'm very glad, happy, and being part of Nokia. Also, first of all, glad and happy that we are all putting effort in in you know, having a better planet for our kids. However, a couple of points in this conversation uh, struck my attention. So wouldn't it be also correct to say that 1% increase in the, in the uh, carbon produced by um, telecommunication, it's actually saving 1 and 1.5, 2 or 3% of global emission in other ways. I mean, COVID taught us that the traffic increased, but then we did not polluted with airplane and car. So just reducing one side without seeing the overall picture, I think would be uh, twisted. I mean, I, I would be gladly increase our TMT uh, global emission if this save other type of emission. Uh, the second point perhaps is we are talking here in Oman, UAE, Saudi, all wealthy countries, but I'm also in charge of the African part. Uh, we all agree that this is an effort, is a social cost that we all want to bear to reduce the emission. But is it correct to push this social cost on African countries that are at the beginning of their uh, digitalization and digital transformation? Open question. The second one is open question for everybody. I, I'm going to talk about the first one because I'm going to go back to that suboptic uh, working group because that was... Yeah. Exactly one of the questions yeah. that was asked to the suboptic working group saying, is it okay to have more emissions because we stop something else? And I know the, the EU has asked that question as well. So that's a really good question. Nobody has the answer to, but there's a lot of debate because if you can, with a little increase in telecom emissions, have a massive increase, decrease, sorry, in travel, that, that makes it's a huge upside. So I know that's something that's being debated and looked at in a number of forums. Yeah, but even again, we we come to the dilemma that we can be as efficient as possible. And 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 I think that the the the, the example of of Luca was, I mean, it it's four C miles in velocity less makes out tons of difference of 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 carbon oxide. So. We can do whatever we want, and and valid question to 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 ask by saying, yeah, but you know what? Um, uh, we know, but I think by the end of the day, we come to a point where we have to say, you know, you can't have it all. You can't have it all. I mean, that would be my opinion. 
and we need to prioritize what is important i mean as i mentioned with with my with my um, example you know when you wake up you first have no not your coffee you look at your messages so is it as important as electricity power water you know is it this one of the becoming the one of the first life thingies robinson crusoe would say no because he has no he has no signal you see my point so for me it's we, we come to a point where we where we have to say okay what is important for us you know is communication in whatever way is it a priority for us globally and is it worth it i mean it, it comes to a moral question and you come into a debate even in political debates by the end of the day what is important and how important is something so it will always be difficult. What we have to do is look into our mirror and to say, what, what can we do better? How can we improve more efficient and 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 do our utmost best and the, be the best in class to, to as an industry to contribute to a more decarbonized global world network or whatever we can do. But we will come to a point where we have to say, okay, what what is air travel more prioritized than communication well we'll come to that point by the end of the day if we don't watch it so that's uh, just a, a footnote guys what can we do else what else can we do I, yes so um very good question uh, and th thanks for that um the africa uh, comment is is very close to my heart and i actually um agree with you i think it's it would be totally and utterly unfair uh, to to demand um the developing countries put their brakes on whilst you know um the rest of the, the the western world and the developed world is already miles ahead so so that would be utter, utterly unfair you know to demand um another um question behavior um, I think human nature is addictive, and and we all uh, check the phone before we make coffee. But I think there is things that can be done in terms of um, you, you know behavioral. As an industry, I think we just agreed that we are all working in terms of reducing the the watts per per gig, cooling, you, you know, and all, and and you know efficient logistics. But I think legislation could could do a lot as well. Uh, and I mean, I just say an example: pie in the sky. Um, maybe no drive day. You know, you know, select. A, um, a I city. remember that 1973 yeah. in the Netherlands. I mean, and in Germany. I mean, it was you could do your skate, your skating things on the highway because nobody was driving. Yeah, and so and so that that. I'm that itself. old already. <laughs> I mean, that's me, not you. <laughs> but that that in itself, you know, is it, it would be a massive uh, game changer in terms of the amount of carbon because it doesn't matter where the carbon is coming from. Ultimately, it is you 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 know polluting and and uh, and yeah. So so thank you. <laughs> I think Luca before and and what I think we should do. I mean, we should not pinpoint by saying Africa as a country. That was your example. You should do this. No, whatever you do. You know what? We are more than happy to help you with the technology we already have. And you're entitled to choose for it, yes or not. But we should support this. We should help this. Not put our finger. No way. We should help and support the continent. Because they do have the right on communication, as we do. Not be, be because in, in the Western world, we were lucky to be more enhanced. No. We are one world. We're one global, and as as um, uh, Efren said um, uh, 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 rightly, you know, there's nobody who says, "Oh, well, where is the carbon coming from? From this continent?" No, it's one world, as we said yesterday, from Oman to the world, right? So, Luca, please. Indeed, indeed, very good question. So, uh, yeah, we have no more. We have no more a right uh, to block uh, someone else's development. And by the way, uh, two things. First, as a telecom industry, let me say, I think we, ha we have a very bad problem. Uh, we are very bad uh, at improving our collective perception. Hmm? Because uh, think of COVID, think of COVID. Pharma industry enter COVID like uh, they were essentially patent, uh, let's say, thieves. Uh, 
extorting money to give an aspirin for uh, three dollars and they came out of covid you know how they saved the world <laughs> exactly with the telecom industry we make the world run during covid and uh, we get out of covid where we're uh, again back to how many gigs uh, you get uh, for uh, one euro so we really did not learn the lesson there so we need to work a lot on how we perceive ourselves and how we transfer our image because i totally agree in term of, in term of a carbon footprint 1% more i don't have the math but 1% more we use uh, there's a lot less that all other sectors can reduce now development of uh, developing countries and of course africa in particular i think we really need to uh, to look at the possibilities uh, i was reading up uh, an article uh, on the times a few days back uh, basically it's going about youthquake which means in 20 years time 50% of the workforce of the youngs will be africans for the very simple reason that all other countries europe is well known but also china north america and even india the birth rates are just low and so workforce has to come for there so you can imagine the huge political implication but there is always opportunity so just think of solar half of africa is the sahara desert can't we do something about that i mean <laughs> we should put that to use so we just need to be you know put intelligence to work no absolutely and in saudi and in other middle east uh, countries because the money is there you see what they can do with the desert innovations are there solutions are there we just need to do it so okay maybe it's a time um we have to consider the other important subsea cable global cable, that uh, power cable, you know, that the uh, solar, green power. It's very, very important for a data center, you know. That's the reason why the Oman will uh, plan a lot of data centers, I see. And also, uh, you know that uh, Singapore, the shortage of the electricity, it is very difficult to construct the new data center. What do they consider power cable from Malaysia, Indonesia, even Australia. We Smith Electric is also the power cable manufacturer. And uh, it is fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know, but uh, the boom for the power cable is now happened. And uh, around 2040, we are full of the manufacturing, not only Sumitomo, but also other power cable supplier. So Africa, you can make a lot of, lot of clean energy that will be contributing to the uh, telecommunication as well. That's my opinion. Again, we come back to what your colleague mentioned in his uh, masterclass this morning, partnering, make sure we do this. And not to say this, not to discuss it, but to live it and to really put the effort. No, because by the end of the day, everybody achieves more with, with that. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we have a timer over there. So, and 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 I have the the guys sitting over there, Bartos and Aurelia, you know. And, and by the way, can we have a big applause for the people who are making sure that this is all happening? The people from the audio and everything, so that we are being heard. And uh, my team over there. So uh, thank you so much, Bartos and Aurelia and everybody else from the CC team. So um, I would like to close this uh, the, this session, not because only of the timer, but we have actually more masterclasses like we had this morning from, from Siena. Um, uh, we have masterclass from uh, Suintoma from, and, and actually from Infinera and, and from, from, from Nokia later on. And actually the, the, the one from uh, Infinera, it starts in uh, <clears throat> six minutes. Um, so I need to hurry, I need to move, um, but we could, we could discuss even more. I, first of all, I would like to thank you all for, for, for being and staying with us, listening to us. I hope you really get something out of it. Thank you so much for, for, for your questions from all of us. And I would like to, I'm very honored to have, um, Luca from, you know, and Javier and Darwin on, uh, on the panel. Thank you so very much.